All right, thank you all for joining Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC show. We're spending some time today with Joey Henderson. Joey, how's it going? Good, good. Bill Northrup from North Park Innovations. How are you, sir? Good, Clifton. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about our A3 flammable refrigerants. Now, when I first put the post out on LinkedIn and through the email links, I said the word flammable without saying the word highly flammable, right? Because if you think back about technicians, especially us refrigeration technicians, just a few years ago, we would look at refrigerants as they were either flammable or they were non-flammable. And that's really never actually been the case. Almost all of our refrigerants have had some type of a flammability depending on how their concentrations were in the mixtures with oxygen and the ignition source around them. So that is all really starting to develop around us. So even myself, I have to be very careful when I'm talking about non-flammable, mildly flammable, and highly flammable refrigerants. So the reason we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this, I just want to many of us instructors were technicians out in the field. And we probably didn't have a chance to work on our A3 or R290 refrigerants, but they are here and they are really coming along in the amount of equipment that we're seeing those in. Well, why are we seeing that? Well, it really comes back to all of these changes that we have in refrigerants and especially this HFC phase down, right? So we're aware that HFCs are being phased down over a period of time. We have a lot of new refrigerants, especially our A2Ls, but we have things like A3s that have been around for over a hundred years. We actually started using our A3 highly flammables back in the late 1800s. We moved away from them because they were flammable, right? <laughs> so we moved into other refrigerants that were less flammable. What we hope were gonna be non-flammable, non-toxic, refrigerants, our CFCs. Well, so we have come full circle. We're moving back into our flammable and now mildly flammable refrigerants as well. So what does that look like? That's a really big transition for our HFCs, which we would consider our traditional, our legacy refrigerants that most of us know, our 404s, our 410s, they're all just going away and probably quicker than anticipated. So we know that January 1st of 2024, another great big drop in the HFC production. So we're gonna see cost of some of those HFCs going up, you know, they're gonna escalate and we're gonna be moving into other options pretty quick. So we wanna be prepared for those. We're gonna see A2Ls. We're going to see a lot more A3s. We've seen a lot of them already hit the market. And we're gonna talk about that here in just a second. So when we look at our refrigerants, our A3s are like our R290, our R600. These are highly flammable refrigerants that we've dabbed with for about a decade with our small coolers, right? We only had a, a low amount of refrigerant we can use. So we only had small coolers. So a lot of our two-door pop coolers, I've seen those in the grocery stores back in 2016 when we really started seeing those hit, right? So we now have four different classifications that we're primarily focusing on. Our A1s, which are a lot of those traditional refrigerants that we knew. We also have our A2s, A2Ls, and these A3s that we're here to talk about today and how well they are, especially our R290. It is a really good refrigerant. It is highly flammable though, especially in comparison to all of our other refrigerants, like our A2Ls, you know, people talk about them being flammable. They're like, I hate that it's even called mildly flammable. They're not very flammable. They are very, very slightly flammable, but they get the term mildly, right? Takes a ton of energy to even ignite them. Whereas like our A3s, the 600 and the R290, doesn't take a lot of energy and they burn very quickly. So we have standards that test that. So if we look at 34, 2019, so that is a standard that we're using part of that a ASTM E681 classification so that we can test refrigerants to put them into their correct classes, right? So class one, ones that we're very commonly used to, no flame propagation, class two, class two L, and then these class threes, which are incredibly flammable, right? And so we've got a lot of information on those. If you're wanting to learn more about in like in depth on those, we've got programs like our combined hydrocarbon and low GWP program that ESCO provides. So I'll leave this in here. So if you want to QR any codes for that, to be able to come back to those resources and even the instructor resources for training on these, especially the low GWP, it's like a 204 slide presentation you can use in your classrooms. It's got a lot of resources on it. All things available through ESCO. So when we get into talking about training on these, we just have to understand that they are very different. A lot of changes versus our uh, A1s and our A2Ls. Okay. 
So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to see new markings on our equipment, right? We're going to start seeing a lot more of these flammable markings, even on the A2L stuff, we're going to see flammable markings. So next time you go to a Costco, just walk back to the part where they have all the window air conditioners. You'll see that almost everything in there is already R32 with these labels. I went a couple weeks ago, shot a bunch of photos. So be aware, we're going to see a lot more labels. We're going to see markings on our pieces of equipment. We're going to see a variety of oils that could possibly be used. You know, our um, our HCs are good with mineral oil. They're good with alkyl benzene, good with uh, PLE oil. We're not seeing that registered with our PVE oils, though, but we do use the PLE. And there's concentration limits that we'll see on some of our new decals, too, especially for equipment used indoors and a lot of specialty tools. Right. We're talking highly flammable refrigerants. A lot of our existing tools are not going to be utilized with this. And Joey, you're telling me a little bit about even on the recovery side that we're looking at the recovery cylinders very differently than we have with our traditional refrigerants. Yeah, that's right. You know, the you know, we know that's 80 uh, percent by volume. And right now, of course, in the small systems, we're not we don't have to recover these at all. Right. No, and absolutely. Not yet. You, you can let it go. Yes. But I'm thinking that when we get into down the road, you've got apartment complexes, you've got multiple property owners that can <clears throat> reuse that refrigerant and other systems. Yes. That's when they might want to recover it and hold it and use it somewhere else. Well, um, if you look at the specific volume of R290, you can only put a little over 10 pounds of R290 in a 30 pound cylinder. And, no and that is 80% full by volume. Right. So it's not by weight, it's by volume. By volume. So, you know, those are something that we're going to have to get used to. And, you know, they'll, they'll yeah. probably be just a cookie cutter chart for it. But, <laughs> exactly. but basically, yeah, you can't put any more than 10 pounds as opposed to 410A. You know, you can get up there in the 25, 26 pound range. Exactly. So, you know, we're going to have some things that are going to change. I've already seen some A3 rated recovery units, though we're not recommending for a for recovery of A3s unless it's in a vacuumed canister and we're pulling directly from the unit into the canister. So there's more specifications out there on that through the hydrocarbon training program. And you always want to stay up to date with where the industry is heading in this direction, right? So the AHRI Flammable Refrigerants Research Initiative keeps us up to date on all of these different refrigerants and the applications that they have. So if you need a quick link to get over to that, I'm going to throw this in as well. So that'll get you over to the AHR Flammable Refrigerants Research Initiative. Very good resource. That's where a lot of the content from ESCO comes from, making sure that it is up to current standards. So when we talk about the equipment that is already utilizing 290, there's a lot of products out there that people aren't aware. We started using like the little two-door pop coolers in the checkout lanes at your grocery stores and in the gas stations. Like I said, we've been doing those since I seen my first ones in 2016. And I know that they were out before then because True was one of the first ones to come out and they had the first training program on these R290 systems. But now we're seeing higher levels of refrigerant being able to be used. And I just talked to Lear last week and Lear has now converted over their ice chests. So those ice chests we're used to seeing sitting outside the grocery stores and convenience markets, right? Those are all going to R290 as well. And we've seen ice machines. So a lot of our commercial ice machines, I've seen Manitowoc already use an R290 in their ice machines and a lot of our, you know, packaged and refrigerant, you know, cases that we see. So R290 is here to stay. So we have to be prepared to work on those. And as instructors, we have to make sure that we can discuss the similarities and differences with refrigerants that we hopefully are already very comfortable with. Now, the thing that is really interesting about this, and we'll kind of dive into this on one of our new trainers from North Park here in a second as well. A lot of places around the world are already implementing R290 into comfort cooling systems. So when I put that post, I put refrigeration and air conditioning. Boy, I got some, hey, wait a minute. What are you talking about R290 and air conditioning? <laughs> well, we're not talking about split systems, but we are talking about self-contained Water to air, so basically little chillers, little hot water or cool water units that can sit outside where we can condition water or glycol outside in a packaged unit sitting outside of the home that can be utilized for bringing in our cool or warm water. We see them for swimming pool applications already. So here in the United States, we've not adopted these into code but it is definitely on the radar. So even this year, so this March over at the ISH uh, trade show in Germany, almost every manufacturer was releasing their R290 heat pump systems for residential style applications. Yeah. So man, the world is changing 
our industry is evolving. We just need to be ahead of it and not behind it so that we can break those stigmas when we see them. Can it be a water source heat pump as well? Yeah, Christian, that's exactly what we're talking about. So at the AHR Expo in Atlanta here this year, we seen our water source heat pumps that were utilizing A2O refrigerants like R32 are already out there. U.S. markets ready to deploy. We just have to transition our thought process a little bit, right? Instead of running the refrigerant into the home, maybe we're just going to leave the refrigerant outside mm-hmm. and we're going to let the equipment outside do some work for us. So yeah, we're going to see a variety of things. We're here as our community. You know, I keep talking about the village of HVAC and I've, I've been told here recently, the village has grown to the point now where we're just a community. <laughs> so <laughs> we're all here to teach you about the things that are coming and to help keep you prepared. Another great reference is to constantly stay up with the SNAP approvals, right? So there's a proposed SNAP Rule 26, which we have a summary of it put together by our very own Jason Abzut, that talks about these newer levels of refrigerant. We're talking in some applications 500 grams. And a lot of us in the field, we know pounds and ounces, right? We don't always think about the gram size. So what is that? In some of these pieces of equipment, 500 grams, that's 17.6 ounces of refrigerant over a pound of R290 in a piece of refrigeration equipment, right? So 300 grams that they're looking at, Mm. and you know, talking about doors and drawers and such, 10.5 ounces. And R290 is such a good working refrigerant that we just need a few ounces in many of these applications, a lot less refrigerant than we've had in the past. So the reason we're here today is to talk about training opportunities for you and your programs. And I have to say, North Park is the very first training company that I have seen to introduce R290 products for our labs for training on. So Joey, let's dive into it a little bit and Bill's going to do some demonstration and our minds are just going to go boom over what's happening in this industry and how far forward we're keeping our training opportunities. So guys, thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thank you. Joey, I'll let you, uh, I'll just be the, the point guy and you run everybody through it, yep, how that, it works. That's good. <laughs> and, you know, uh, before we get started, I, I yeah. do want to throw a few things out there about R290 that <clears throat> they would like to settle people. Because, uh, you know, when I heard, you know, when I started getting involved, I was like, oh, no, everything's going to blow up, you know. Right. Oh, but, it's propane. You know, <laughs> had the same fear. I introduced 410A into the market for South Carolina. Uh, and everybody was afraid of it because of the higher pressures and thought it would blow up. And then yeah. there are 22 guys felt the same thing when they were switching from R12. So nothing's new there. <laughs> right. here's, the, here's the deal though. We're going back to um, really going back to the good old days because one, you don't have to recover it. You can yep. let it go. Uh, two, you don't have to worry about <laughs> whether it goes in as a liquid or a gas. It can uh-huh, be charged right. either way. So that, right. that doesn't matter either, which is really nice. It's not a blended okay. refrigerant. Uh, nope, not a blender refrigerator. Right. Uh, the PT chart doesn't have dew point, bubble point, all that good stuff. You yeah. know, it's it's really, I think, a lot simpler. I it mean, is. the number one thing is that when you do release it, um, you you should always have combustion gas leak detector and just lay it there on the ground because it drops down low. Right. And then um, and a, a good safety it. practice is going to have a means of dissipating the air, yep. especially if you're inside of a cooler or a box. Uh, blow the air out of there. Put your combustion gas leak detector. Once it says it's safe, you're, you're good to go. So yep. really, that's about the only thing. And other than that, I mean, we're in good shape. I've seen some videos where guys didn't do that. And of course, we know the result. Sure, absolutely. Uh, also, it is propane, but it is not the same propane that you put in your grill. Such a good point to bring up. Right. It, it's, it is, but it's, it's 90 plus percent pure propane. But what's in your grill is 80% propane and the rest is uh like stuff to make it smell and, and exactly. yeah, all, yeah all kinds of mm-hmm. good extra Odorants, stuff right yeah um there is no odorant for r290 so you will not smell it yep. like your propane so just keep that in mind be too. aware you know, right yeah, so okay now with that said let's uh let's take a look at this training system this is the uh the new training unit for r290 so bill you want to step over there for us and sure can you bring us a now, little close to it? You know what? I'm going to do it. You just uh, and yep. uh, the just beauty tell of me, these. How do you like that, guys? That looks, that looks good. We aim her down yeah, just a little, little bit. Down. All right, hang on there. I'm going to have to spin it. 
And no, those of you familiar no, no. with our training units, you know, there's a variety of these tabletop units that North Park has already been introducing. And that's what caught my attention. You know, we're not talking about a large cooler that has very specific requirements on where that's we good, can put Bill. it. We're talking about a nice tabletop trainer where we can teach the fundamentals of refrigeration. And now we can teach how it applies into flammable refrigerants like R290. Now, what I, what I must say here, this one was our original one we built. Yep. And we don't have the red markings on the, gotcha. the, uh, the line sets to indicate that. But that's the only difference. We've, we didn't put it on yet. It'll be red sleeves on the line set. Exactly. Which is the red markings that we'll see. So in our training materials, if you're not familiar, in the training, all of our flammable refrigerants will be identified with red collar markings. It's all part yep. of that instructional material. Said so if you're looking for that, I got another resource we can bring. We've even got the e-learning module on talking about these low GWP refrigerants and how they fall into the different classes and all of the requirements and specifications. So there's a lot of quality information to prepare you for teaching your students flammable refrigerants. Right. Uh, and uh, Bill, uh, so this is iConnect training, and everybody, if you hadn't seen it, just go to iConnectTraining.com, and you can see mm -hmm. all the different options and videos yep. out there for it. Uh, and this one, Bill, this is the TU. This is the uh, 806. 806. TU 806. Yeah. And, uh, the, go ahead. Uh, it, it has, um, uh, uh, you know, it's got a standard tin can uh, uh, compressor here. We are coming out with one that has a variable uh, frequency, mm. so we'll be able to show both of those. Also, we have an EEV. Uh, this one has an EEV as opposed to a TXV. Okay. So um, those are some of the features. Of course, you can adjust the fan speeds, call fan speeds, and uh, you know our signature sight glasses here. Yeah. So you can really see. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, you know see here here. here. Mm -hmm. Here, here you got vapor, and here you, it's taking the trip to a liquid, yes. right? So uh, that's the unique thing about it. So you can really see um, the phase change. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's what we're yeah. talking about here with R290 is you know breaking these stigmas that, yes, it is a flammable refrigerant, mm -hmm. but it's a refrigerant. You know, we talked about this right. earlier, Joey. You know, when you learn the fundamentals of refrigeration – does it really matter what refrigerant is in it if we're following the proper safety practices? Right. I mean, that's the thing is that I think this training unit will show people that it's, you still, you got the same saturation temperatures in the evaporator and in the condenser, depending on the application. So, you know, we're, we're still going to run this like an air conditioner. So we're still going to have around a, a 40 to 45 degree saturation temperature on the, the back pole. Yep. And then you're going to have, you know, 100, 110 degree condensing temperature uh, on the condenser. And that's all we're trying to maintain, whether it's, you know, R290 or 410A or 32 or 454B, it doesn't matter. Um, so that really, if you follow those rules, you'll be able to follow any refrigerant in the system. I think what I like about this one is it shows that everything is still operating just like it always has. Exactly. Nothing has changed. we still got a reciprocating compressor. Uh, we've got uh, fan motors here that if we, with this one, we can adjust the airflow across either coil, create scenarios, and they're going to see the same troubleshooting practices that we've always used. That's exactly Super right. Superheat, subcooling, uh, the EEV operates just like any other EEV, nothing special about it. The only thing that's going to be different when we get into these other units uh, is they're going to have, uh, when they got contactors, they got relays, they're going to be enclosed. Yeah. Uh, so there's no sparking. You're going to see different types of uh contactors and relays that so they're not exposed with arcing we don't have that in this system at all we don't need it we've got it enclosed already exactly um, so you know i like this and, and of course we've got uh one two at least three versions of this tabletop out now and then we've yeah. got a fourth one coming that's going to have an inverter compressor uh it's a heat pump it's going to have reverse valve of course uh indoor and outdoor coils it's going to have everything in it including r290 uh, right. So you're talking about a water source heat pump setup. This that'll be about the closest you can get to one, and it'll teach you everything about it. Exactly. Um, it will. Do you well, do you want me to go now to uh, show? Yeah. So you can yeah. look at some of the temps and everything. Tell me. Here, I've got to put yeah. this up. But so we got but, away from traditional 
uh, gauges, you know, brazed to the unit. Yes. And instead what we do is we now will send a TPI kit that is a uh, wireless probes to a tablet. And, um, what we got up on the screen there is Bill is just wirelessly casting we go, guys. from yeah. the tablet to the TV. Yeah. Sure. And so, he has mapped all the probes to the tablet within ignore. seconds. So in the classroom, now we have the yep. opportunity to have Are you there? One. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we see it. Go ahead. Okay, do you, can, can you see everything or you need me to move? No, yeah, well, that's not too bad. We might bring up the actual gauge uh, screen. Oh, yeah, yeah. But can you see one. everything to the bottom as well mm -hmm. as the top? Yep. Okay. Yep. Good All right. Good so. Bill's cameraman uh, took a uh, break. So we had, <laughs> we're used okay. to working solo around so, here. <laughs> so what we're doing, uh, can you can you see the uh, the uh, tablet here? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I can't see the picture. Exactly. So, so what we're doing is is we're delivering our, our whole new platform with a uh, it's going to include the tablet, include the case, and you know it has a hand strap, but also we're including a device that you plug into the um, HDMI on any TV, and without internet, it'll it'll cast to the TV. Mm, man, now and, we're getting somewhere. And so now you can see. Now it's displayed on the TV and I'll be operating from the tablet. So you can walk around the classroom and still everybody will be able to see a big screen. Exactly. It gives us the opportunity to have one trainer, but if we have a projection device like a large TV or even just a projector and we have right. you know, an availability for an HDMI connection, we can now introduce all of the diagnostics, all the live data into the entire classroom with yep. one unit. And then we can take turns physically working on it, helping right. spread our time out a little bit better. I'm all about utilizing our time as best as we can. So uh, the way we have it right now, you can uh, remap all the probes as you need to if you don't have the probes on correctly. So they'll all remap. Yep. And uh, then once you map them, you just simply hit next. Then you go to uh, the profile. Now, this has already been profiles. You can see the R290. Yep. But if you were working another trainer, of course, you just select Which this one? and select the trainer that you're working on. And then it, it'll, it'll display everything as it relates to that particular trainer. So could we okay. have two separate trainers, one with R290 and one with, say, 134A or 404? Yes. And be able to bounce back and forth to look at comparisons between the two systems. Well, we ship one of these with every trainer. So you'll have yeah. one with one trainer and one the other. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So now, now we've got the profile correct. And as you can see, it's an EEV, it's air conditioning, it's about 400 CFM and a, a 10, point, uh, 10 to 12 sear, 290, tonnage is 0.33. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can adjust your outdoor temperature by adjusting Just, the speed. By, right, right. Okay. Because, because, you know, we figured uh, wherever it's being used, depending on the lab, you'll want to put in the temperature that the lab's running at. Corresponding, absolutely. Okay, so we, we have all that. Now we hit save. And now we have our standard gauge set, right? Um, you've got your pressures, your temperatures. And then, as you can see, uh, SLT, right? If you can see the bottom SLT, there's a little um, blue dot. You touch the blue dot, and it tells people Give some what's definition. SLT. Yeah, exactly. Definition. Joey you know, came up with that. Oh, look at that. I should have uh, I should have. Look at that. that. He, so, he's a tech at heart, boy. He's got our he, back he's, for sure. He's got it, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that gives you an indication of a uh, standard gauge set. We wanted to keep it really simple. Yes. And, and of course, we worked so that it would be simple. Um, and uh, again, Joey helped us a lot with that. Now you change. And of course, now you go to your airflow measurements and your psychometrics. Hmm. And that's the other screen we have. So by using the variable speed motors, we can actually duplicate scenarios on our trainer. Say a dirty <laughs> condenser. We can oh, yeah, yeah. We adjust our airflows and be able to see what it actually looks like. I I right. got to say this, that in the past, 
you know, we would stick paper against. I'll say I don't screen, have to bring cardboard with me. A cardboard. <laughs> I mean, I did everything possible to simulate yeah. it. And now you just take the the dial and you just turn the air down and turn it back up, and you can. Yeah, and I just did. Engage. It's great. Oh yeah, there we now. Kind of hard okay. to see from this distance, but sure. Hey, Bill, throw, throw back up the gauges again. Yep. And then we can see it starting to change. How see, I, see, I just adjusted the uh, evaporator um, uh, fan speed, right. right? Wow. So, and then you can play with it. And then, again, now I'm going to go ahead and put it full back up. And you'll, you'll see the pressure changes. Now, uh, kill, the, uh, kill the condenser airflow, Bill. Okay. And while we're doing that, uh, we'd love to know where everyone's chiming in from. Hop over there in the chat message, whether you're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, let us know where you're chiming in from. We're always curious where everybody's joining. And if you have any questions about our R290 training, because it is a change from a lot of the traditional refrigerants that we work with. Back on. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to don't want to get over pressure and go yeah. out by over pressure. <laughs> I want to kill our baby, you know. No, not exactly. this week. So there you go. Yeah. And you, you know what I love about this? We worked so hard to make sure you didn't have to drill down five, six, eight, ten different menus to get what you wanted. So it's only four buttons that you push, and every profile is already re ready to go. It's already set. Um, you know, the tablet is already set with the app. It's not something you get from the store. It's our app we built in house. Uh, and, but it all comes preset. So you don't have to get on the internet, download, set an account, nothing like that. Right. Turn you don't have it on and yep, hit just connect, turn connect, it on. Boom. It's and off you go. Easy. Yep. easy. Which you I, got think, it. I think is going to be very important when we start talking about our new refrigerants, we don't want to overcomplicate things. I mean, yes, right. we want to make sure we're understanding the fundamentals in our classrooms. We want to make sure that we're diving deep into how things operate. But when we start talking about new refrigerants, it's very important to be able to monitor and explain easily so that we can you know, learn about these differences. Because we're really not talking about a lot of differences as far as functionality. It very much right. comes back into our fundamentals of installation and best practices, right? If we're yep. already comfortable with the proper best practices and they didn't get diluted while we're out in the field and in the, our career, it, it lays true to when we're working on even things like highly flammable refrigerants. Um, right. Can you give us some recommendations when we're talking about working on these pieces of equipment, Joey? Uh, well, yes. Uh, First of all, just to, um, oh, and let me point this out for you too. Look at those pressures versus temperatures. They're not that far off from R22. I was just looking at that. It looks very familiar so it, to it, me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're a little lower than usual, but not much. Uh, and look at our saturation, 41, 42, mm. 114 on head. Uh, so that's, that's to me, that's a, that's a great, you know, we don't have to really learn too much different. Yeah, But exactly. as far as on the practices side, uh, number one, you're going to have to have as a standard new tool is combustion gas leak detector. It's just going to be as soon as you get in. And, you know, guess, guess what? A leak search is going to be a lot easier, too. Because I just feel well. <laughs> yeah. Now, and, and, you know, if you're worried about it, well, if I got a whole lot, it's going to be messed up. Well, remember, we're not putting a whole lot in the system anymore. So it's not exactly. like a pound charge, you know. You know, the, this whole notion of fear of our 290 when every, everybody has 25 pounds on their porch of, of uh, propane. So it, yeah. when how you much, think we, about it. <laughs> how much yeah. A3 are you sitting on in your work van on a fuel Yeah, let me walk is, out uh, into my back deck well, and I got a whole butt. bunch of propane out there. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. You know, one of the um, questions that just came in. Um, an instructor from California says, does R290 also use as an automotive drop-in in R12s? No. So that's the thing we have to be aware that, you know, our highly flammable refrigerants are only qualified for certain pieces of equipment. And right. I will um, I will bring that back up for us here in just a second so that we can talk about what those applications are. So I'll come back to that here in just a second um, so that we can show you 
some of the pieces of equipment that those are being qualified for. But so far, the only things that we are having, there's no drop-ins on those R2Ls. The things that we're seeing for replacements in automotive are our A2Ls. And in right. Europe, we're even seeing CO2. So Mercedes-Benz manufactures a CO2 air conditioning system for automotive. You know, they're trying mm, to get yeah. down to these low GWP refrigerants in every aspect of the HVAC and refrigeration industry. So lots and lots of changes everywhere. We just need to make sure that we're coming together and talking about these so that we're aware of what these changes look like. That's right. The other thing that we mentioned too earlier, just to repeat it, is that <laughs> be sure you know how much refrigerant you can recover back in a cylinder if you're, if you're starting to collect it you know, for yeah. multiple properties of a same owner, which you can do. Um, and, uh, and I really stress to have a small uh, fan just for to dissipate. Circulation. Uh, and when you're inside of an enclosed space working, if you oh, start yeah. to work in a reach in or something, just stick that combustion analyzer in there. And if it goes off, you know, get some air moving through there, stick it back in there and just let that be your guide as to when you can fire up that torch. Uh, that's going to be our biggie. But other than that, the practices are the same. You know, 500 microns in a vacuum, nitrogen when you're brazing. Um, nothing has changed on that. Uh, POE oil, uh, like I said, you don't have to go in as a liquid or a gas specifically, although if it's in a vacuum, you can. You just go in as liquid as a lot faster, you know. Sure. But you can uh, adjust the charge with gas. Not a problem at all. So it really is going back a lot like R22. Yeah. Uh, Except we don't have to, and then we go back before 1991. We didn't have to recover anything. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many thousands of pounds of water we do. I let out of a chiller. Oh my! You know? Yeah, before the days it was required. So one That's of the questions right. that just came up um, was about the R290 and the applications in R290. So this is part of our SNAP 26 rule summary, which is what we're wanting everyone to pay attention to. So if we go to EPA and then we go into the SNAP policies. We're very specific on the refrigerants and what they are allowed to be used in because they will not be allowed to be used in anything other than what the EPA mandates as acceptable for those particular uses. So we're going to see R290 in a lot of our you know, packaged refrigeration systems under 500 grams. And then down the road, who knows what else we're going to see. But for the moment, that is what we're looking at is our potential use of our 300 gram limits and 500 gram limits based on the type of equipment. So find that in our SNAP policies from the EPA. All right. So tell me more about this little trainer. So um, I love the ability to be able to show on screen what we're working with. I love the ability that we can manipulate things on the system, having one unit to do that with. Did you find any major differences in construction as you're designing our R290 trainer? Not, not really at all. Yeah. No, it's very similar. It's very similar to, you know, uh, 134. Yeah. And the heat transfer rate of R290 is extremely high. So, you know, the efficiency of a refrigerant is uh, incredibly good. Yeah. Uh, as you pointed out, it does take less gas, right? Yes. Refrigerant. Yep. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, also to point out, too, that the reason, you know, back to our, our EPA and training and 608 training, you know, the whole reason why they're going to these AL, A A3s and A2Ls, but A3s in particular, is the, uh, you know, at first our concern was, uh, you no know, ozone depletion rate. So right. 410A knocked that out of the park, no yep, problem. There goes our right? ODP, right? And then our ODP, no sweat, you know, and we didn't even know what GWP was. So it wasn't then, even focusing on that. What are you focusing on? So right. and all of a sudden they started talking about GWP and all of a sudden, you know, 410A is uh, running down the back alley. And so um, uh, the R290 has almost zero um, uh, I think it is zero ozone depletion and it's, uh, the, I think the lowest, of uh, GWP. Well, let's go back um, and look at it, right? Yeah. Let me yeah. back up real quick and we'll talk about actual GWPs that we have of refrigerants that right. we know. I think right 290 now. is three and 600 is less than one. Okay. Let me get, if I pass that quiz. All right. So here's the reason that we've done this. Remember, you're right. Back, back in the 1990s, when we were looking at how our world was changing, what did we talk about? 
we talked about the hole in the ozone layer, right? You know, I can remember being a student in elementary and we were talking about the hole in the ozone layer and how we were going to, as a world, change this new issue with our planet. So we focused on ways of doing that. We reduced emissions in com internal combustion engines. That's when we came along with catalytic converters and new ways of mixing our fuels. Remember, we didn't completely reinvent the internal combustion engine. We made it more efficient, right? And we made it less polluting. Right. So when we move into technologies in HVAC, we just simply, we started looking at our refrigerants and we moved away from our ODP refrigerants and we started moving into replacement refrigerants. The thing we didn't pay attention, you're exactly right, Joey. We didn't pay attention to this one simple fact. If you look at that global warming potential on the very top, R22, R22 had a global warming potential, 1,810. When we went to R410A, we actually went up in our global warming potential up to 2088. It just wasn't the most important thing. We were getting rid of the hole in the old zone. That was the <laughs> important thing, right? That was the mission that we were after. And NASA will prove and show to you that if you go to nasa.org, you'll actually find, you know, daily live um, ozone records and it'll show the depletion of the ozone layer. And we've been very successful at reducing the ozone depletion that we have. Right. But then we started noticing these other things like global warming and these changes in our world environments. And we started relooking at things and we started focusing on the heavy hitters like these 2088 GWP of R410A and the 3920 of R404A. That's why when we talk about these refrigerants like R290 and even our HFOs, like these 1234YFs and ZEs, these new refrigerants that have very low global warming potentials, but they are a little different than things that we're used to in the past, right? When we talk about refrigerants that are flammable, are highly flammable, and refrigerants that are mildly flammable, we just have to know the best practices. Because when it comes down to it, and we take a look at this marvelous trainer that you have, is it really any different than pieces of equipment that we're already accustomed to? No. Not significantly. I mean, what not, are we trying to do with our spark-resistant components? We just don't want to light it if it has a leak, right? So we seal our components in our motors and in our controls and in our if we have contactors are just put into sealed compartments so we don't have the potential for ignition. All makes sense to me. We're sure changing enough. the refrigerant with a better refrigerant and we're just making our system more efficient mm -hmm. with less emissions, right? That's all we're doing. And I was looking up the uh, trying to find out there's a, a maximum number for that GWP that they want to see. Yeah, and it and, depends on uh, where you're at, whether they're falling that 750 or the 500. You want to see, yeah, we're going to yeah. see areas that are pushing for lower GWP allowances than even what the federal level are, and they're allowed to do that by states. So we will see, um, you know, uh, we will potentially see many of our HFC refrigerants like 410A and 404 going away much quicker than even anticipated. So we must get comfortable with A3 refrigerants and our new A2L generations of refrigerants. And they're, even those are not new, right? What's R410A? It's an A2L called R32 right. mixed with a you know flame reducing refrigerant called R125. We put half and half and we end up with R410A, right? And A1. Right. So A2L refrigerants have been around a long time, just like our A3 friends that we have right here. Right, exactly. Mary, lots of goodies, lots of good stuff out there. Any questions out here in the uh, in the community of our HVACR? This kind of stuff we have to talk about, and we have to bring in our trainers. We have to be able to work on these pieces of equipment. Because if I'm a technician and I walk out into the field and I know nothing about A3 refrigerants, and I walk up to a refrigeration call and I see some red markers and I see some little triangles and I go flammable refrigerant. Nobody taught me about flammable refrigerants. Right. And I'll tell you this too, that the one thing I like about these trainers is that once you get it and I've got several different styles, mm -hmm. it's yours. Um, and so you can go and do the piercing valve on that. You can, you can bleed out that refrigerant. You can use Recharge. a combustion analyzer. Uh, right. you can just get the fear out of the way in a classroom or in your, at your company, if you're doing a, a training with your technicians, let them practice on that. They do the same thing, pull a vacuum, brace it again. And they'll see it's not going to kill them. It's not going to blow up. Um, and then they can charge it and watch it run again. It'll be just like they would do it in the field. They can do it on this training unit. And um, it, it, so they can, they can practice 
you know, recovery, or in this case, just venting, yep. uh, and then vacuum down and recharging, no problem. And that's one thing that we have to be concerned about when we are bringing in highly flammable trainers into our classrooms. Ventilation is now something we may pay more attention to. So if we're already set up with a brazing facility with proper ventilation, we may start looking just at the locations that we're going to be our that we're going to be doing work on our pieces of equipment. But absolutely, it's a fully functional piece of equipment. That's what I loved about it. And it's already got flare connections on it. If I want to teach how to do proper flare and pressure testing, right. and there's a lot of little things we can do there. Uh, just had a question that came in here from uh, Greg. Greg says, sorry, I missed uh, the first part of the show. When do you think we're going to be switching to propane? Well, Greg, that's what we're here for, my friend. Um, all of these products that you would currently see out in the industry uh, have the potential to have R290 in them. So every one of these are products in the field currently that are using R290. So there are a lot of, I don't want to even have the Manitowoc ice machine on here. I, I, that's my bad. I'll add that in later. So uh, most of our small refrigeration systems, um, if there's fresh air ventilation around them, they're in open spaces. They're going to be using things like R290 going forward. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, it's, this is goes to show why we do this. Uh, my mm -hmm. friends, we talk about these things because they're already here. I said 2016, I encountered my very first R290 cooler in the field by accident. I was doing some PMs at a grocery store that I was working at at the time. So I was a mobile engineer at Meyer grocery stores for about five years. And when I first got there, I was doing some PMs on some freshly remodeled grocery stores and uh, went through and I was checking out some pieces of equipment and went R290. I'm not familiar with R290. And mm -hmm. of course, you know, my, my phone wasn't that smart at the time yet. <laughs> so I had to go back to my computer and go, R290? What's R290? Propane? Wait a minute. I got propane in my checkout lanes? <clears throat> so, yeah, it's been around you for know, a while. Now that you mentioned it, Clifton, I do remember uh, <coughs> this had to be probably 10 years ago when there was a, um, a publicized drop-in for 22, and it was propane-based. Oh, yeah. I know where you're going. And, uh, that too, you know, yeah. the problem is, is the reason it didn't take off, everybody was, up, you know, scared of it. They didn't sure. know, you know, and this was just partial propane. Right, just they a were little trying bit. To match. As yeah. you can see, I remember uh, when I was involved with uh, when 410A, before it came out, so I was uh, the tech rep for Carrier, and we were mm -hmm. first promoting Puron. When I was going through the training for it, of course, I didn't know anything about it. I was... 410A certified in 1997, I think yeah, it was. Early uh, Didn't see a unit till 99, but uh, they said that at that time, propane was on the table to replace R22. Uh, of course, the problem at the time was the volume it would take to do split systems and all that. Right. But it and was the out there code. already. They were already considerate, and some manufacturers were using it as a drop in because, as you can see, with those pressures and temperatures, it's not that far off from 22. Absolutely not. Uh, yeah. Which brings up, you know, Bill, uh, can you tell us a little bit about this heat pump trainer that's coming through? That's going to be an R290 trainer as well. That's pretty yeah. intriguing. What I could do is take a trip. Oh, now we're talking. Well, let's do a field trip. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I All love right. my road shows. Let's but, try it. I'm, I'm feeling uh, it's going to have to be a road show to uh, North Park Innovations in the near There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> so while we're heading over to take a look at a R290 heat pump trainer, anyone have <clears throat> any questions or positive comments that they want to bring in? We'd love to know how you feel about this because we're all a little intimidated by change, right? Especially things that change the, uh, the, the job that we work in and the environment that we work around. But as long as we're prepared for them, it's not a drastic change. Tell me if this is uh, working okay. Is that? Oh, yeah. Can you yeah. see it? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, that's, well, that's, that's great. great. Right there, Bill. Perfect. Okay. Right. right. So, so again... That's a um, variable flow refrigerant heat pump, uh, you know, variable speed compressor. Mm -hmm. That's the same compressor that's in all, all mini splits. Yeah, that's a rotary. Yep. yep. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a really cool rig. And um, our partner in France designed it. Okay. And um, it's, it's a great rig. Yeah. And uh, we're going to put these into production. Uh, I think we're going to deliver the first one in uh, August. 
Wow. And so, so how much refrigerant is that running on there? I, I don't know. Do you know, Joey? He told us, I don't know. He did, but it's, it's a, it's probably not like oh, the other one. You know, yeah. Just a few ounces. And, uh, wow. You know what, what Bill, see, if, if you look down there, there's a, there's a, uh, a little plate that's got the little knobs down there. What I love about yeah, that. Yeah. Now I can't see, but right, can you right see there. this? There you go, Bill. That's it right there. So we actually have the ability to not only control the RPMs of the fans like before, but also we have the ability, I love this, we control the RPMs of the compressor. Right. So, so true. So we can let it do its own thing according to the, the call from the EEV, uh, but we can actually uh, control it ourselves and show how as the RPMs go up and down, the, the flow of refrigerant goes through the system changes, the amperage of the motor changes, the pressure temperature changes. Um, we got the reversing valve there right in, uh, you know, view so we can teach the reversing valve. And uh, what I like, too, is you can take a little magnet, put it on the body of the reversing valve. And as it shifts, the magnet moves with the slider. So there's, a, yeah. you know, it's all you, you've got everything right there. You you've got inverter technology. You've got a heat pump. You got the ability Hello, to switch GWP it refrigerant. Cool. GWP refrigerant, it, it's all there. Sure. It's really, really. And uh, what's interesting, he came up with a great concept. Can you see this? Yeah. These come off. So the idea is we have these all over the trainer for component location. Yeah. And then yeah. You, just, you just pull them off <laughs> oh, man. and put them on it. the table and mm. tell the, the student go ahead and uh, uh. label everything. Absolutely. Yep. Isn't that a great idea? He he did that. And Lionel is he's great. Very sharp cookie. Man. I love so that. uh we've been enjoying working with him and mm -hmm. and uh we're gonna come up um with a with a with a true uh variable refrigerant flow with heat recovery. Okay, so so we're we're gonna have a trainer where you could demonstrate moving heat from one room to another with heat recovery. Wow. And uh, so we're going to do that. We're, you know, as you mentioned, the new trainers uh, that they're doing it. Did you guys want to see any more of this? That's good. It got me all excited and it, it just brings okay. up those interesting conversations. So I'm sure there'll be plenty to follow up with this. All right. <laughs> the idea is the, you know, the, we're going to, the new, I say the new trainers, uh, it's actually the, you know, the new technology where they put the propane outside, right? It's, it's a chiller, right? That, that's what it is. Yeah. It's, it's chilling water and you're moving glycol and that's it. Hot, hot and cold. Excellent. Absolutely. One of the yeah. questions just came in, you know, with mitigation, will we see different mitigation on these R290 versus A2Ls? And we got to remember that the mitigation that we're talking about right now on A2Ls are on residential split systems. And so that is the primary focus on mitigation at the moment. But yes, I'm sure we will see changes in mitigation if we get to the point where we increase the capacity of their R290 going forward. It's another one we have to stay up to date with our you know, AHRI standards and what ASHRAE is setting. And we have to stay up to date with, you know, the, the rules, the regulations, and definitely our building codes. Cause that's another one that has to come into play is not everyone accepts all the refrigerants for all applications. So here's a, that link again to stay up to date with all of our AHRI flammable refrigerants and standards that accompany those. Cause we're already seeing that even with A2Ls. You know, with A2Ls, there are jurisdictions that are so far uh, not accepting of A2L refrigerants in some of our residential split applications. So sure. we all have different jurisdic jurisdictions that are accepting and moving along. And we'll see that in refrigeration products as well, I would imagine. Yeah. You got a LinkedIn user question there we missed. Um, oh, yeah, that is an interesting one. So... Does this mean that it is less carbon as per SC standard propane? So yeah, we talk about being a purified propane and that's one I'll have to bring a manufacturer in because honestly, I have not spent any time on the manufacturing side of our R290 to see if it is synthetically based or if it is petroleum derivative. Well, I assume petroleum derivative, but I couldn't vouch for that. I, I won't say this 100% certainty, but I did speak to the Kimmore engineer about it. 
and I, I believe it is petroleum based. It's just it's called it's called the term I've heard was lab grade it, propane. It, yeah, it's got to be right. Yeah, I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be cost effective. Uh, right. I, w- I wouldn't think, and I guess I don't know enough. Uh, here's another one that came in. So, what's the performance of R290 refrigerant in high, medium, and low temperature applications? Well, we can see where they are so far going into. So if I may pull that back up real quick, that is actually in the current SNAP26 rule where those could be applied to. I don't know if I can enlarge that. So if we look at right now currently, so we have R290. Now this is the proposed rule that is out uh, right now. So currently we're looking at R290 in retail food refrigeration, new equipment only, refrigerated food processing and dispensing equipment. And we're also seeing it in commercial ice machines, new only, that are self-contained. And we're seeing it in retail food refrigeration, new only, that are standalone units. So that's the importance of following SNAP is that we can verify and validate where the refrigerant applications are going to in, you know, the, the manufacturing facilities. All right, lots and, of good stuff out there. And the performance factor of it, I think, was he just asking, I'm, I'm assuming compared to like- Compared to other refrigerants. R134A, yeah, the performance <clears throat> factor uh, yeah, so far I, as I've seen is excellent. Yes, so. I don't have any stats to be able to show that, Ignacio. Um, I'll, I'll keep an eye for that. Keep in touch. If you want to get a hold of me, it's cbeck at escogroup.org. I'd be happy to follow up that conversation. Um, tell us a little bit about how do we contact you guys when we're looking to learn more about R290 trainers for our classrooms and R290 education and education in general. Go ahead, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, it, as HVAC Consulting Services, I do a lot of uh, webinars, a lot of on-site training, uh, I do public speaking. And so if you want to get in touch with me, you can uh, just hit me at a uh, joeyh.hvac at gmail.com. I'd be glad to start start a discussion with you. I've got a website, which is uh, jojohvac.com. And also from there, you can go to my YouTube where I put up videos uh, for people to see and no charge for those. They're about 10 to 20 minutes long on different topics. Uh, so far, I had some good responses on those as well. Awesome. Great. And you can get a hold of us. You can look at all our product line at iConnectTraining.com. And um, you can get a hold of me anytime at Bill at NPInnovations.com. So uh, we've got uh, another, another piece. We just added a, a line of products called MarkCraft. And we have cybersecurity we have IT, we have green energy, solar, wind, and hydrogen. And uh, frankly, I think that um, we, the combination of green energy combined with HVAC makes a whole lot of sense. It's the only way to go. Yeah, we're going to see yeah, shifts. Yeah. We've already seen that ourselves. I was just at a <laughs> uh, Ivy Tech Community Colleges, one of the Ivy Tech Community Colleges oh, here yeah. in Indiana that has an HVAC program, and they also have a emerging technologies program where they have solar photovoltaic and they have you right. know, wind energy. And now we have those two departments going, Hey buddy, <laughs> we should it's be just, working together. Cause this is really all very oh, much about, you know, the same and similar technologies. Oh, absolutely. It, 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 it's a beautiful uh, combination really, because yeah. if, if you're the type of technician that can work on HVAC Number one, you're an electrician. You better be because a yeah. huge bit of this is being an electrician. And a mechanic. And, and a mechanic. And a uh, uh, hell, uh, <laughs> you're into physics, you're into electrical. Engineering. It, engine, it's fantastic. Are we really. science, math? <laughs> <laughs> and so now to take the step to photovoltaics mm-hmm. and, and the combination because – Many houses are going to take the trip to have photovoltaic on the roof. Sure, it's already required in some counties in the United States yeah. for new constructions. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Yeah, we're already seeing you know solar powered AC DC <coughs> inverter driven heat pump systems. <coughs> 
think about it. Now you're not taking the trip to DC, up to AC, back down to DC, right? Yeah. It'll it'll all go D and, and houses eventually will probably go to DC if you're generating on the roof, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, let me throw this in here before our time's up too. Yeah. Uh, I work real, real close with uh, Bill and Lori at North Park and uh, a lot of my time is with them and they've got a curriculum coming that is really going to be good. It's going to be connected to all the equipment and we'll start doing uh, curriculum training with those trainers through the web. Nice. Right. A and, and a good deal of it a good deal of it is with ESCO. Exactly. Which is yeah. it's, it's why we so bring these partnerships. Yeah. It's a community. We can't do yes, this individually. It is. We all mm -hmm. have to come together to, you know, encourage and empower and educate an entire industry. We're not talking about just the new technicians. We're talking no. about all the technicians in the industry now sitting here on this web going, when's R290 coming? And we go, <clears throat> Behind the ball, about a decade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a whole lot of, uh, installed base you know that that is the old school so you, you really got to learn old school and the new oh, school yeah yeah absolutely to be a good technician 100 percent. yeah all right one last opportunity for anyone to dive in with questions or comments we thank you all so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing these trainers are you going to be bringing this one to the uh 2024 national hvacr education conference oh man we're going to have all kinds of trainers mm, there no, this included and you'll see the one that i just showed you the production model um and then by then i hope to have uh uh some interesting um that I'd like to bring the, the chiller, you know, the new 290 outside, but yeah. we can't have it that much inside right. yeah, on the right. trainer. Absolutely. But we were thinking maybe we'd have I something, can, uh, we'd, we'd use a gas that would be very similar yeah, so absolutely. people could understand the, the physics of it. Mm, boy, I got an opportunity to talk to you guys about that. Mm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much. Joey. Thank you, Bill, Clifton. You guys are just such an asset to our industry. You know, when we look at companies and, and trainers, and educators that just come together to make an industry better, it's, uh, it's a warming place to be. And well, I love it. I love these friendships. It, this is fun. It is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. I, 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 I get love paid it. for this. Right. I don't know about you. Guys. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I figured this thing out. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's cool. a great industry. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you all once again, and we will see you next week on Did You Know the ESCO HVAC Show. Great. See you, guys. see you later. Bye bye. <laughs>